So Gartner says worldwide IS public cloud services revenue grew 30% in 2022, exceeding a hundred billion for the first time. I went looking for stats on the growth of IS, also known as infrastructure as a service. This is the latest one that I found. But just from my experience in the field, I know IS is just growing and growing and growing. Now, alongside that observation, I personally think that infrastructure is the future. If you follow me on Twitter, you probably hear me talk about this a lot or read about me talking about this a lot. But think about it this way. Every cloud platform is essentially infrastructure, right? Every application, every architecture deployed, regardless of the abstraction that you use, deploys on infrastructure. I feel like every day there's some new company going viral because they say they're leaving the cloud and then they run to what? What is their solution? Infrastructure. I personally want to do a deep dive for the rest of the year into infrastructure. And obviously the most affordable, most accessible way to do this is infrastructure as a service, right? I can't go and build a state-of-the-art network rack at my apartment in New York City. <laughs> you know, I have my home lab, which is actually great to learn infrastructure stuff. But IS is still going to be more affordable and more accessible in terms of trying different configurations and all that kind of stuff, right? So today, well, actually the next couple of videos, they're going to have a focus on IS, but there are different components in IS that uh, it'll just take a couple of videos. And today I want to more so focus on virtual machines and kind of outline a foundational project for learning IaaS that you can later just build on top of. Okay, with all that being said, hi, I'm GPS. I do cloud things at Microsoft here on YouTube and welcome to a new, don't forget to like and subscribe, please. Video. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's switch over to the screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll link this in the uh, description. I'll link everything that I share in the description. But what I want to talk about, I want to talk a little bit more about IS just for for a little bit. So let's move over to Scally Draw, and let's kind of talk about the different uh, cloud um, cloud service models that we have. Right. Uh, so if you're studying cloud, you should know there's a couple of these, right? At the very bottom, we have IS, right? Then we have uh, PIS, PIS, and then we have SAS, and then we have more specialized ones like uh, uh, functions as a service. We also have containers as a service. Now you have, uh, I think they were calling it like AI as a service. And I know there's, uh, there's data. I think they're calling it data as a service. There's a whole bunch of like specialized ones, right? But the thing is all of these are sort of just abstractions on top of IS, right? Because when you think about it, IS offers us the most flexibility and customization, but it also requires the most amount of work. And then everything on top of it ends up just removing certain aspects of the administration of the infrastructure that you're working with at this level, right? So if you, if you excel at understanding what you need to, to work at this level, everything else, is going to be simpler for you. And the cool thing is that if you learn the skills that you need at this level, you can go and work. This is important. You can go and work on-prem, hybrid, multi-cloud, single cloud, whichever deployment model people choose. I remember when DHH and uh, Basecamp, I forget the higher level 
company name. They were talking about how they moved back on prem and then they just had their cloud and DevOps people focus on on prem versus cloud. So there was like some retraining and, and such. Yeah, learning at this level will sort of prepare you for that. So wherever the field goes, you'll be fine. That's what I'm trying to say, right? So the way I see this, right? So let's like move this over. Let's move this over here, right? So IS, we have a uh, pretty much three, three pillars, I would say, three like major categories of components. We have compute, right? And then we have, uh, what else do we have? Come on, it's not copying over. There we go. We have networking, right? And then we have, what else? Oh, storage, right? We have obviously security and like other aspects, but uh, all of those are more so characteristics of each component instead of an individual component on itself, right? You can't just have security if there's nothing to secure, right? So all these things added up are essentially the components that make up IS, right? So for today, I want to focus on this, uh, this one right here, this category of components, compute. I was reading this fascinating paper that I will also link in the description. It is called The Ideal Versus the Real Revisiting the History of Virtual Machines and Containers. And it talks about, it talks about a lot. Like the first kind of concept of virtual machines go back to like the 50s. And then they have this cool chart of the evolution of virtual machines. And most of us are kind of up here in this area where, you know, where we see Kubernetes and Docker and then AWS somewhere around here, right? But there's a whole history behind it. And I think it's so cool. They talk a little bit about, where we go down, let me find it. Early virtual machines. They talk about the M4444X project by IBM, right? Back in the 60s. So cool. Highly recommend this um, paper. Like, read it over the weekend. I'm actually going to include it in the newsletter uh, that I send out. If you want to subscribe to my newsletter, uh, I'll have it in the description. But yeah, pretty cool. But yeah, when we think about kind of like, in my opinion, one of the biggest technological feats accomplished in the last 50-ish years, it's definitely the virtual machine because the the scale and the, uh, I guess, ex access that it's given us to compute power has powered many technological breakthroughs and projects, right? Think of now, like AI, we can access these large language models because they run on virtual machines that have become efficient enough to make that available to the masses, right? And the, additionally, I guess the flip side of that is also the bottlenecks on how fast we can get these things uh, up to standard to do more and more and more, right? But at the core, it's a virtual machine, right? Now, let's talk about a how you can approach learning virtual machines All right, so let's we're going to say this is our virtual machine right the first thing i want you to do is go and figure out what the cheapest virtual machine is available for whatever cloud you pick aws Azure. if you're looking for azure it's probably going to be like the the b uh the b1ms or the blms yeah one of the b series right and I want you to select like the cheapest and then maybe like the second and the third most cheapest. And then with that, I want you to compare, just read through the documentation and the pricing information of each and understand the limitations and sort of what you get between those different SKUs. So pick two or three, right? I want you to first learn under like being able to read documentation and uh, understand kind of the languages of how, what people use to describe virtual machines, right? So that's going to be your first step. And 
let's I guess let's write this out here here. Pick or find cheapest skew of VMs. VMs. I'm using I'm still getting used to the split keyboard. I'm way better than I was like a month ago, but I'm still getting used to it, so please bear with me. Right. So that's your first step. Find that. After that, what I ideally think we should uh, be doing is actually, let me put this one, one, yeah. find cheapest VM. After that, the next thing I want you to do is to simply, oh, where'd it go? Over here. Simply deploy it. Two. Deploy via UI. Right. And each cloud calls it something different. We uh, in Azure land call it the portal. AWS calls it the console. I don't really know what Google calls it, uh, but whichever one you use, be, use whatever, deploy it via the UI. So click through it. Last time I did it through Azure, it took like five minutes to provision. Which, and this leads me to my second thing. Once you deploy it through the UI, I want you then to go and learn the equivalent CLI command, right? The equivalent CLI command. So in Azure, that would be AZ VM create. Okay. And I don't know the other ones. I'm sorry. I just don't. <laughs> okay. So then I want you to learn how to create, create the same virtual machine that you selected and that, and then that you ended up deploying via the UI. Learn the command and the options because you have to provide like, uh, there are a bunch of different parameters that you can provide uh, with the CLI and just learn how to do that. Okay. It's very important. Okay. Right. Now, obviously delete them as you go. So for example, if you deploy one in the portal, once it's deployed and once you see it as deployed, just delete it. There's, there's no reason why you need to have like a bunch of virtual machines, at least at this point. Then you deploy via the CLI, you play around with the AZVM create command, right? And you know how to do that. Great. Delete that too. Because then what I want you to do, actually, in this step, you could probably do uh, be able to SSH after create. So there's a way with the command. I'm not going to tell you how to do this, but this is something you should, when you're working with a command, is that you can provide SSH details. So in the terminal that you're running your Azure command to create the Azure CLI command to create the VM, the SSH public key that you're, you're leveraging, you can leverage that to SSH straight into the VM. You can have the command return the public IP of your VM, and then you can do SSH, whatever username you provided at the public IP, and then be able to SSH straight into it. But this is a configuration that you have to figure out, uh, which is part of the project itself, right? Okay. So next up, what we want to do, and I think I find it that you will learn more if you do this step by step, but if you want to figure it out all with one VM, so be it. I'm just thinking like create and then de delete it and then create and then delete it. I don't, I doubt you'll run into quota issues. Uh, yeah, you should be fine. Okay. So deploy via the CLI, you do AZVM create, be able to SSH after create. And additionally, you want to use a network security group and we'll call this rules and a network interface card, which is uh, abbreviation NIC to only allow SSH from your IP, okay? This is very important. Very, very important here, right? Now, let's uh, scroll out here for a second. You don't want to allow absolutely anyone to, because you're gonna have a public IP. You don't want it to just be open to anyone who wants to SSH into it. So now with the uh, CLI, you have to figure out how to configure it in a way where you're only allowing your IP address, so the public IP of your computer, 
to SSH into it. That way, if I try to SSH to it from my computer, I can't because it's going to be denied, right? This starts to dive into the networking aspects and the security aspects that we're going to continue growing into and building upon, but we need a foundation in place, right? Now, another config that I need you to set up is auto power off. Okay. So you can configure this as well with your uh, CLI command. And I know some of y'all are thinking, why are you not talking about infrastructure as code? We're going to get there. Okay. We're going to get there. Give me a sec. But these are just, I, I want you to learn how to do these via commands. And you can also turn on, turn on, and then off uh, via CLI. There are the uh, AZVM start. I don't know that that's it, but there's a command that you can use to power your VM on and off. Make it a habit of turning it off, but additionally have a policy that it turns off automatically at like a specific hour. Like, I don't know, whatever, 10 p.m. at night for you or whatever it is, right? Okay. I should also say you don't need a crazy amount of storage on your VM. I think the 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 base at the B the B series, like the cheapest one, is like 32 gigs. I think that's more than enough, right? Because again, we're just more so figuring out configuration than anything else. Okay. Okay, let me think. So we have auto on and off. We have this here. We have uh allowing from SSH power. Okay, cool. So I think in terms of the characteristics that we need for the base, like so just for foundational VM, these are everything, right? Now, what I need you to be able to do, oh, one other thing. Yes, one other thing that I would like you to, f actually that probably, this would probably be the next step, okay, anyway. Since we're gonna we're gonna consider this like the foundational VM for the rest of our IS adventures, we're gonna need to be able to reproduce this in, in, instead of having to type in the commands every single time. We don't want to do that. That's a waste of time. Now you have two options. You can either uh, script, so you can create like a bash script or something like that, or we can go ahead and just dive right into infrastructure as code, which that is what I would recommend. You can have bash scripts. And for something like this, you know what? Why don't you do both, to be honest? Like put all these commands into, like put all of these into a bash script or a PowerShell, whatever it is that you use. And then once you understand that, put it all into a... I don't like this to have double. Uh, how do I remove this here? Into uh, infrastructure as code. This is going to get you some real hands-on experience here. Nice. So what you end up uh, wanting to have is like a like a main.tf file, like a main.terraform file, or a bicep.main file. Uh, I think, oh, well, if you use Azure, it would be one of those. If you use Pulumi, whatever it is that you want to use. I know AWS has its own. You end up having a single file that you execute and that'll just configure everything for you. Now, the extra thing I think that is very helpful to configure in this step, you can do it in both actually, but we'll put it in here, is store SSH pub key in secure key vault. All right. So what does that mean? Uh, we'll put it here between these two. You have a public key that you can generate from your terminal to be able to SSH into your instance and so into your virtual machine that I mentioned. If you store it for, so I'm going to use Azure as an example, if you store it in a key vault as a secret, then you can configure your infrastructure as code to use that. So it can create, in the context of Azure, you can create a, uh, oh my goodness, why is the name escaping me? The managed... Uh, managed identity uh, to connect securely from the, the VM to the key vault service and it grabs the secret 
which is your SSH public key. Your public key is fine to have it stored in your key vault. Your private key is what you don't want, but that should stay on your local machine. Your public key can be fine in your key vault. And you're going to use that to connect directly with your virtual machine and have the infrastructure as code configured that way. That way, when you are running the Terraform code, you don't need to provide it as an environment variable, right? I think that's a better practice than providing it as an environment variable. So store it in there, then have your infrastructure as code go ahead and configure everything for you. So it configures everything else like this. And then you should end up with a deployment that looks something like this here. You have uh, your Linux, I called it Linux Playground VM. You have a disk and you have that network interface card that I mentioned. Obviously you have a VNet. Uh, I have a static IP address. You can use static or dynamic if you like. And then you obviously have the network security group with the rules that will only allow your IP to, to SSH into it. Uh, so I have a Terraform config here. This is my readme. I don't actually, I don't want to show you my Terraform config because I want you to all and do it, do it. Yeah, do it on your own. But anyway, this Terraform configuration sets up a Linux virtual machine with auto shutdown at a specific time, restricted access to specified IP addresses, SSH public key stored in an Azure key vault, and a configurable VM size and Ubuntu version, right? And then it tells you kind of like the, the, the variables that you'll need to run the main TF. You can, again, choose whatever tool you'd like. With your infrastructure as code, uh, there's some custom data you'll probably want to look into. Um, this is just kind of what I found for my own uh, research and use, but um, pretty standard things like uh, updating your packages, uh, fail ban, uh, pretty fail to ban, pretty popular for hardening SSH protections, uh, prohibit password use for login, that kind of stuff. And then your goal is that you can run Terraform apply. Uh, well, obviously initialize it, plan. Uh, once you work with Terraform, you'll understand all of these. And uh, it'll deploy exactly what you need, right? So I was just playing around with a couple of options. And you see uh, I've got all my resource groups here created with uh, that little script. That is a terrible circle on job. But you get the point. And then from this, later on, if we, well, not if, when we start introducing things like load balancers or multi-tier uh, architectures and things like that, Everything is going to be on top of this, and you're going to see a lot of similarities, right? Obviously, different components will have different configurations and parameters, but a lot of it follows the same kind of like, okay, find the right size, find the right image. Uh, yeah, are your, yeah, what like variables are you going to need to use and configurations are you going to need to use? How do things connect? How do, do, how do you, you, access things securely. Once you start using infrastructure as code as well to deploy things, you'll kind of start to realize that there's like a similar fashion in working with these things as well. Once you know how to work with uh, infrastructure through a terminal, um, it's less overwhelming. There's a lot. This is just, I think, I, in my opinion, the foundational. It's kind of what I'm using to play around with a bunch of different components. But abstracted to the very, very minimum, this is what you need. All right. Infrastructure is the future, y'all. So let's let's get our hands dirty. All right. Also, this runs for like seven dollars for me. So I think it's very affordable. Uh, so, yeah, I don't see any reason why not to, especially if you have a turn off. All right. I'll see y'all in the next video where we'll cover. Uh, what do I want to cover next? I probably want to cover deploying two VMs, having them be able to talk to each other and maybe have like a database on one or something like that. And then we can move into like some more networking stuff. All right, cool. I'll see y'all in the next video.